Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Uptempo Talks brought to you by Runners Connect. I'm Coach Dylan Bellis. I'm Coach Roy Moynihan. And glad to be back here. I actually spent my last two weeks in St. Louis, Missouri. Mm -hmm. So a bit of a opposite side of the spectrum when it comes to, to training here at Altitude where we have uh, cooler temperatures, low humidity, nice sunny days. Um, I got to spend some time in St. Louis where it's quite sticky and I'd imagine. Much, yeah. much hotter. So, But don't have the altitude, so that's nice to have a little extra oxygen in the air. Pretty easy to breathe, or did the humidity kind of counter that? <laughs> um, it was easier to hit paces for harder workouts, but um, easy days were arguably harder than yeah, it was the, at altitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so easier to get up and going and feel good at speed, but not necessarily the, the best of feelings. Yeah, just looking at our athletes' feeds on Runners Connect, I think a lot of us are waiting for those cooler temperatures that fall will bring. So we are. Hang on. I know a lot of you have hit record highs around the country the if you're in the summer. U.S. and even worldwide. So yeah, endless summer is kind of what it seems yeah. like around here. So, anyways, let's get back into our episode for today. So um, another segment of why do runners do that? Huh? Basically, a segment where we encapsulate. You know, why do runners do certain things and like, you know, sometimes they're out of the ordinary. Sometimes it's so simple. We just kind of, we've always done that because that's all we know. So we have our three topics that we're going to discuss today. Our first being, that's right. why do runners run the day before a race? Um, I don't know about you, but when I was in, when I was in high school, we actually had practice off for the entire week before our state meet. And we would, we would only run... 10 minutes or so, <laughs> two days before the race. And that was it. Uh, we didn't know any better. That was just kind of how, how we did things. So, um, Roy, if you don't want to kick us off, you know, why, why do we run before the day of the race? And why is that so important? We'll kind of avoid getting to the whole taper thing because that's its own animal. But specifically yeah. running the day before a race, I think, is really important. We can talk about, you know, time duration and all that. But I'd say one of the main reasons that comes to mind would just be keeping up the routine. Mm -hmm. Most runners, unless you're running every other day, depends where you're at in your training, yeah. it's just going to fall along with the routine, the predictability. If your body is used to coming back every 24 hours and running, it's going to respond well. Uh, your neuromuscular system needs to be primed. Uh, there's some studies that even show just taking a day or two off can you know, kind of lose that sharpness. Oh, sure. Again, it's not really a matter of fitness. Yeah, I also like it just to kind of see how things are feeling, mm -hmm. just test out the legs. Now, you could argue on the flip side, it might make you a little nervous because you're imagining that every single ache and pain is something very serious. But overall, especially if I'm like traveling for a race, let's say I, you know, take a flight in, go mm -hmm. to the race expo. This is during normal times. Usually I'll just feel so amped with adrenaline Everything real, feels really good and I want to hold back. So just a nice way to burn off some energy and yeah, get the blood flowing. Any other physiological, mental aspects you can think of? For sure. I mean, I think one of the big things is just having your muscle tension being high enough. So basically having high muscle good tension point. is that is that feeling of having good pop, you know, nice, rhythmic, you know, feeling sharp, you know, not that dull, tired, but like nice and energetic and, and feeling like, hey, if I do these strides, like I feel good, I got a nice mm -hmm. release off the ground, like everything feels good. Um, and that's kind of what we get from adding things like strides or like those shorter, faster workouts the week of the race. Um, but I think one of the big things is just to maintain that tension going through the race because I'm sure that we've all been there. We've all had races where we tend to show up and we just feel flat tired, lethargic, maybe we cut back too soon, maybe we didn't have those muscle tension building workouts prior um, to the race, um, and just kind of felt off. A lot of it can come down to travel too, I know. Yeah. Runners mention like, oh, I couldn't, I didn't have time or I got in so late. But even if it is late, mm -hmm. I highly recommend, maybe you want to get into the specific time ranges, but if you can just get out the door for like 15 minutes, mm -hmm. it, it can improve things markedly. Oh, I agree. I mean, we can even talk about, you know, when we went to Las Vegas and we did that half marathon out there, You, I don't know if you remember, but we actually ran the morning of the race mm -hmm. because... Afternoon. Yep. That race was at 4 p.m. Like we woke up, we traveled the night before. Again, it's not that far from us. It's like three and a half hours. But still, it was enough time to be in the car, be a little bit more like tired, that sort of thing. We slept overnight, woke up in the morning, and actually went for 10 minutes. It was like a 10-minute shakeout sure. just to kind of get the blood flowing because it was a later race. 
let's definitely dive back into like how long should those should that run be so personally for me i like to keep it around like 30 minutes yeah if it's a marathon that usually ends up being like four miles for me but i think it's all very much relative in relation to how much you normally train so if you're training for a 5k and you've only been doing 30 minute runs i wouldn't recommend you go run 30 minutes no. that day um, in that case you know go for 10 or 15 minutes just shake it out nothing too crazy just um, nice and easy, getting things moving, you know, shaking out the nerves, like you said, and maybe even throwing in some strides to help muscle tension for the next day. Agreed. I would just say, um, even if you, you're used to running based on mileage, the time is kind of nice. Yeah. It may bug you. You only did, I don't know, 2.8 miles. Yeah. But just cut it short there. Running by time is more likely to uh, hold you back in a way. Yeah. And even with strides, I like to do them as well. I might just do three or just cut back the duration. If I normally do like four by 20 or four mm -hmm. by 30 second strides, I just might make them 15, add a little pop without overdoing it. Yeah, but definitely. I mean, and then adding the strides before the race as well, you know, that sort of thing, just kind of keeping things on yeah. right? I've actually seen some really interesting research on this topic of muscle tension of having athletes even doing like plyometric activities or okay. like doing things like getting a medicine ball and doing sit-ups and throwing mm. medicine balls so maybe just a full body rather than just running muscles so i thought that was really interesting not something that i'm recommending to anybody to do go do tomorrow but um, it has been something that has been a bit more prevalent in the research and kind of finding how we can get you to feel good before your race. Because I mean, that's, that's half the battle there. It's, you know, we can do all the work, but it plays a big role on our confidence, how we feel that morning. It's fun to look into these sort of things just because, you know, a lot of people might skip over it or not really understand why we do it. Interesting stuff. Perhaps we can uh, include a link to that study. So if any of our athletes yeah. want to read more about sure. that concept. Sure. Absolutely. They could maybe try it out, you know, during the time trial phases, most of us are doing might be a good opportunity to try it where it's low stakes. It's not like an official race. Now's a good time. Now's mm -hmm. a great time. Question number two, why do runners do that? Why do runners, specifically beginning runners, often get the very traditional running injuries such as shin splints, plantar fasciitis, um, or even like patellar femoral or runner, runner's knee? Why do we so frequently get these injuries, especially when we're first getting started? Yeah, the, the big one that jumps out to me, at least for very new runners, would be shin splints. As a high school cross country coach, that was probably the number one complaint early on. Yep. A lot of factors go into that, uh, which we can dive into, but I'd say typically it's just adapting to that new stress. Yeah. Most people, if they're not coming from the running background or haven't really done the longer distances, mm -hmm. typically they're doing it on pavement. They're not used to going that far. And, you know, runners get kind of excited when you, I'm thinking of the season, the first week of the season especially. You're trying to show off your teammates and maybe look like your fast and press coach. And uh, yeah, you can do a little bit too much oh, yeah. too early. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with you there, especially at you know the youth age of things. Mm. Like we get kids who, they don't run all summer. And That's then true. you go immediately into, this is what we're doing. This is what we do every day. These are the workouts. And it's just a meat grinder, right? And like these, some kids can adapt to it and and they'll get stronger because of it, but then you'll get like a big group of people who have, mm -hmm. they'll have injuries like, yeah, shin splints, knee pain, plantar fascia, IT band, like I've had all these things and it was for like, those exact same reasons. It's just, you get excited about a plan, your coach, you know, a group, whoever you're running with, and you tend to just overdo it. And then a lot of people, especially if they're newer in the sport, they will, you know, maybe not have the best running form. Like you said, their body hasn't adapted to the stresses of running as of yet. Um, and there's a lot to learn. And so as you do more training, gain more experience, get more knowledgeable of the sport, the form, how hard you should be running those days, your body will also adapt to that as well and you'll be stronger because of it. You have to, you have to experience it to actually learn from it. Uh, I think it's really easy to sit there and say, hey, slow down, do this. But sometimes it's, it's almost important that you allow people to kind of make their own mistakes so that they can learn from it in the future. So. It's not limited to age. Uh, adults, same thing can happen to them. And I'd say uh, I want to talk about footwear because I, I usually find one of two things, whether it's an adult or like some of my high school athletes. Mm -hmm. They'll either come in with a pair of old shoes mm -hmm. that they've worn for all activities. Maybe they were a soccer player. Yep. And it's just their kind of shoes that they'd wear to practice when they did 
their drills and, you know, the running laps around the field. But they've had those for maybe like two years. I'll ask them, how long have you had those shoes? Yeah. And then they're already kind of maxed out. And then they're jumping into, you know, doing three or four miles a day from doing very little. Yeah. So those shoes are shot. Or on the flip side, I'll have an athlete come in and they're so excited because they're wearing the brand new shoes mm -hmm. and they're breaking them in for that first weekend. They either just need to get used to the shoe themselves or unfortunately, since they don't have the running background, they've purchased the totally wrong shoe. Yeah. Or maybe someone at the store, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, you know, didn't necessarily fit them with yeah. the proper footwear. Yeah. If you're a new runner too, it's, it's very easy to kind of just kind of use whatever shoe you have mm -hmm. or you go to a running store and like maybe it's not the right shoe for you like there's a lot of those things and as we know like the best shoe is the one that's most most comfortable for you um for any beginning runner i think it's it's really important that you as much time as you're committing to running you try to commit as much or not as much time but relatively um, a significant amount of time to also focus on doing some strength exercises as well. Especially if you want running to be something that you're gonna do long-term, mm -hmm. you gotta take care of your body. Our, the founder, creator of Runners Connect, Jeff Gaudet, he actually had a new book that had come out recently. That's right. Um, and it's called Easy Running Plans, Total Body Training for Speed, Strength, and Endurance. This book was really designed for the new runner. Like instead of having to focus on rehabbing, 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 let's let's do the opposite and focus on prehab before those injuries happen. So basically you're allowing yourself to mitigate those injuries before they happen by getting stronger. Good plug there, shout out Jeff. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been working on this book for, yeah, years essentially, kind of compiling all his knowledge mm -hmm. and personal experience and it's available on Amazon. So might as well throw a link down there yep. in the description to that too. Looks like we have one more question. It is the season, the year, 2020 will probably go down as the year of time trials. Why are some of these runners, whether they're professional or otherwise, running really weird time trial distances? Is there any reasoning behind that? And what are some examples of the distances that you're seeing out there? There are a ton. A lot of people are running less marathons right now mostly because marathons are such a huge community like event where there's just crowds of people and it's hard to run 26 miles by yourself like how many people have places where they can just go run run 26 miles while having to cross roads while have to a lot of people live in cities a lot of people yeah. live in even rural places where like you can't even do that so the marathon has been less frequent this year and a lot of people are focusing on other events to help further their training, but in a different way. So yeah, I mean, it's really fun to run odd distance races. Um, we're personally running a mile this coming weekend. So, I mean, that's pretty cool. But... TBD for me. Yes, but... yes, TBD. So, I mean, I'm a, mar anyway. I'm a marathoner mm -hmm. racing a mile. It's really cool because we get into these habits of just marathon cycle after marathon cycle after marathon cycle. And what we don't realize is that because we're dedicating so much time to the marathon, because we all love the distance, we all love the race, we all love the community, we are actually sacrificing some of those, uh, some of the benefits of training for the lower distances or the lower races. So I think a lot of people right now are finding that time to, to do something different, to do something fun, to do something that's engaging, and, and maybe even to help support their training for the marathon. I think a lot of people go straight to the marathon, but if they focus on racing a mile for a little bit, they might even get stronger at the marathon over time True. because their speed base is higher and they're naturally endurance gifted, mm -hmm. that gets easier to translate over time, especially for those who haven't been training for decades. Um, what, are the, what other items do you have to add? Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I think variety plays a key role and just adapting to whatever yeah. circumstances you have. Uh, it's more common in the trail scene, but I'm doing a 27K race on Monday, which is why I'm hesitant now about yeah the mile time trial, but yeah. I'm really just doing whatever races are happening. Of course, that, that distance is just a feature yeah. of the trail itself, but I kind of wanted to point out some weird distances that are happening. Yeah, well, this one was new to me. I knew there was a world record for it, but I saw a lot of track athletes doing the 2K. Yeah. So anyway, I saw that happening. And then even just today, uh, someone mentioned to me that NAZ Elite yep. is doing an event tonight, at least the day that we're recording. 
and one of the, the race distances is an hour. I'm presuming, yeah, they just see how far they can go in an hour. Yep. Now, I, I'm actually kind of intrigued. I would like to see more of those yeah. time distance races outside of the trail scene. It is more common, 6, 12, 24-hour races, but I think it's kind of a fun concept to bring to the track or roads. Yeah, I think a big thing with a lot of the elite athletes right now is that you get bonuses for getting world records. Mm -hmm. So True. some of the oldest world records are the ones that have not been attempted. So comes down the money too. <laughs> so the 2K race, like how often do you see someone run a 2K? Mm -hmm. So these companies offer huge, like tremendous incentives for getting world records. And once you do that, I mean, it's, I mean, it's a nice payday. And it's nice to have a world record next to your name, right? I mean, that's why you saw people doing world records on the half marathon you, and on the treadmill. On the treadmill. Mm -hmm. You saw people doing that on the 100 miles on the treadmill. I've seen that on indoor track. Um, but yeah, I mean, now that we are getting to a time where there are not a ton of races, but and because of that, people are missing out on contract mm -hmm. opportunities. They're racing these um, obscure races because they offer that value and that kind of wow factor to kind of get them on the news. It's a nice publicity. Good point. Yeah, the press and marketing. Yeah. They got us to cover a lot of these events. Yeah, so, yeah. so the 2K is one of those races. Um, mm. as is the hour run. The hour run historically actually used to be a pretty significant event, not only in running, but also in cycling. I don't know what it's called, but the indoor cycling arenas, I have no clue what they're called. Please correct me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Knows this. That yeah, was a too. pretty significant um, event. I don't know how long ago, but basically you get on this 200, 400 meter indoor track, basically on a bike. Mm -hmm and you're just cranking out an hour sure. for as far as you can go. Um, there was actually some really interesting research points with this in uh, one of Steve Magnus's books. I can't remember exactly what it was called, but really interesting. So the hour event used to be something that was, was more common a long time ago, but now has kind of resurfaced because now we're trying to rewrite records. Mm -hmm. So we have NAZ. I know that Matt Baxter is going for the New Zealand record, which sure. is it's a little over 12 and a half miles for an hour. So he should be able to get that. That's really solid. Actually, Mo Farah is doing an hour record as well. What? Um, I don't know. Separately. That, separately. I'm not exactly sure of the place where it's at, but it has been announced that he is going for mm -hmm. the one hour world record, which is pretty cool. I can't remember who had it. I think it may have been Haile Gibbs Selassie. He might have the one hour record at the moment. So I'm excited to see it. Um, you know, Mo's been away from the track for a little bit now. Uh, so kind of good to see his name resurface on something other than a marathon. Yeah, it looks like we'll have some uh, new races to, to feature on our news update yeah. probably next week. So. But yeah, I mean, I mean, time trialing these off distances, you know, like I said, great way to, to support some of the, the other traits of your races. So let's say you're racing a marathon. It's good to race a half marathon because it supports the marathon. Just as if you're running a 10K, racing a 5K is a nice speed support of that 10K. Uh, same thing with like a mile race, you know, mm -hmm. good to work that kick speed. That matters at the end of the 10K. Um, helping boost your confidence with, you know, getting momentum rolling into that goal race, you know, working weaknesses, being able to compete. That's a big one. Having fun and getting experience. Great. Thanks for the input. That would conclude another episode of Why Do Runners Do That? We hope you've been uh, tuning in, whether that's on YouTube or the podcast. Keep submitting the questions so we can keep these episodes going. We've gotten some good feedback from our athletes and just new viewers. So guys, till next week, this has been another episode of Runners Connect Up Tempo Talks. I'm Coach Dylan Bellis. I'm Coach Roy Moynihan. Till next time. Have a great run today. Mm -hmm.